Uh, welcome to my studio. I'm uh, going to give you a little demo today on basics of raising. Uh, so this is my, my little hobbit hole I built several years ago, all solar powered off grid. Uh, unheated too, which is fine. It's actually really nice in the summer, nice and cool. In the winter it's a little chilly, but it's cool when you're hammering. But that's why I bundled up a little. Uh, but let's go on in and start hammering. Welcome to the inside of the studio. Um, so today we're going to be doing some raising, um, starting with a flat disc. Um, I'm going to use a six inch size here, which is the size I normally use. Um, it will give us vessels about like this particular size. Frequently I also go with, um, got these cut out already. I usually cut a bunch at once, just it's more efficient that way. So I've got seven inch, eight inch diameter, and then 12 inch diameter. Got an 18 inch one, which I got quite a while ago and haven't used yet. Just, I don't know, I think a bit more before I do that scale, because it's a, it's a project. Um, okay, but the goal is we're gonna try and transform this one into something more like this, um, that has a pointed end on it. Uh, so you can see the various processes involved in that. So if you start with a six inch disc, six inch diameter, it will tend to give you a piece that ends up being you know, if you add the height plus the width, we'll give you about six inches. So this is probably three by three. Whereas this one is an example of an eight inch disc. So it's probably about four by four. Um, so here, this one is a seven inch disc. So this, I'm guessing here, we're probably about four by three-ish, somewhere in there, three and a half by three and a half. Um, this one's a 12 inch disc um, and that is a it's a rule of thumb it's not dead on accurate you know give it a quarter inch half inch either way um, but that just helps you if you're actually shooting for a particular size to know what size disc you want to start with um, so I've already got this cut out so you're not going to get to see that but it's you know however you cut them out I use a throatless shear um, I've used electric shears, I've used hand shears, I've had students who I guess really are into sawing to get that jeweler saw out, you can do it that way. Um, I think Rio sells six inch discs already, if you want to get bigger then you still have to find a way to cut it. Uh, really a throwless shear is the best tool for that, that's what I've found. And with that I, I start with my flat sheet and then I will use a set of dividers and get it set so that I'm at you know whatever diameter whatever radius I need so twice gives me the diameter figure out where my center point is get a uh, a center punch and just give it a good whack you don't want to go all the way through but you want a good punch in there because we're going to be working around that the entire time so we don't want it to disappear and then the next critical thing is you got to make sure to anneal it. Uh, right now this is very work hardened so it's not ready to move so we've got to first soften it up so we're going to take it to the torch. This is my annealing station. Uh, I've got just regular hard fire bricks down here. Uh, the hood itself was actually it was a sandblasting cabinet I bought. It was going to turn into a sandblaster once and then realized I didn't need a sandblaster and realized the legs that were here could just mount on the bottom and flip it upside down. And so now it all together is up in there, although I found that uh, cobbled together, but it works pretty good, so. Okay, um, normally when I do this, I've got a switch here. I would get my exhaust fan going, so I'm really sucking the exhaust out before that really gets going and making noise. We're not gonna do that just for the demo purposes so you can hear me. Um, so what I'm using, I've got a Goss propane air torch is what I use for most of my annealing. Um, it's actually, they called it a ham glazing torch. <laughs> um, I don't know, for all of you who do pig roasts, I guess. Um, the idea was that it's shorter than your regular weed burner torch, but you know, the, the weed burners work as well. Um, 
I have a blog post on this too, I believe, that shows, uh, or that I talk about what torch I use. I'll try and get you links for that uh, if you're interested. You know, the idea is basically we're looking for a larger flame, fuzzier is better. Part of what I like about this one though is that I've got a pilot light which I can adjust, whether it's minor or not a little bit. And then I can adjust what the full floor, full, full throttle is with it. So that's quite handy that I don't have to always have it running at a full blast. Okay, so I'm going to start annealing this, and ideally you heat it up evenly all the way around. But in all honesty, with copper, it's pretty forgiving. Uh, but when I do really big pieces, I will just spot anneal the zone I'm going to work on. Uh, but okay, and. Again, know your own metal, what you need for it. With the copper, I'm looking for a dull red, at least. Sometimes it helps to pull the torch away a little bit to see the color more. Where, oh, it could work, but I'm going to take it a little bit hot. That's pretty much what I'm looking for here. I don't know if that will show up on camera, but it's glowing just a little bit dull red in kind of a darkened environment. Copper is pretty forgiving. You can get it fairly hot and not overdo it. The biggest thing I find those coming from the jewelry side of things do is they don't heat it up enough because they're thinking I've had the torch on it for so long and it's not there yet because you're used to these smaller pieces of metal. Um, you really need to watch the color to make sure it gets to the right temperature. Um, so, you know, grab my copper tongs. And then I quench it in a water bath first because I don't want hot acid flaring up at me. Um, and then to clean off all the, the oxides on here, I put it into a, a pickle. Um, I'm using the, the sodium bisulfate Sparex pickle solution. Technically this is annealed right now and you could go and start raising on it, but what happens is all of this oxide will start to get hammered off into a fine dust into the air and you start breathing that in and you just you don't want to do that. Um, if you're like me and you've developed a serious copper allergy, it gets really bad. So we will drop it into the pickle and let that uh, clean up. So these are the steaks I'm going to use for this today, the, the demo. Um, and I should say, you know, any sorts of tea steaks and things will work, but this is kind of a newly designed set that I did share with you, um, which I... I'm going to do a vessel that has a pointed end, you know, one that's designed to actually use all the different sizes and shapes so you can see what they're used for and why you might need them. Um, this particular one, well, let me back up here. Um, it's set up with different screws in here and a few different holes so that they get held into a vise and they can be held securely at different angles. So it kind of sits on the top and the bottom and gets locked in place. So it actually sits more secure than a traditional tea stake, I think. Um, this one right now I've got situated so it sits in my vise at about this angle. I actually want it at a bit more of an angle. I tend to use this one higher up. So I'm going to change the position of this screw. If I change this up one, that should do it. Um, use a Phillips head and I've got a nut on the back. So we see sometimes, yeah, often I just have this finger tight and I don't even need the wrench. And it seems to work fine. Usually my experience thus far has been that once you get it set to your particular vise with the uh, tools you're using you don't need to fuss around with it anymore and then you can just tighten it down good and, and you may never need to change it again. Um, I'm also leaving out the washers this time. They're, they add a little spacer. Um, it's kind of involved how to fit it to each individual vice. I don't know what vice I'm gonna have. Each vice is a little different, so I talk a lot more about these on a blog post that I have on my website, which you're welcome to check out if you wanna learn more about these. Um, if I have extra sets of these available, I do sell them, but I think the blog post can also help you if you have the equipment and wanna make your own. It gives you a sense of what's going on. So I leave that to you to uh, investigate if you wish. So tighten that down a little. Okay, so that should work better. Um, let me talk a little bit about the hammers I'll be using here for raising. 
Um, these are the basic ones I'm going to use. So initially when I start, I'm going to do a little bit of sinking. And for that, I like to use this petting hoss one. It's just got a round face. So when I hit the metal, it moves it equally in all directions. That's what these round ones do. Won't use it much, but just a little bit. Then I'm going to move on next to the cross peen, sort of more traditional raising hammer. And this is what I'm going to be using the most. The cross peen moves the metal more up and down and less side to side. Um, when you get to something like this, it's much more up and down and far less side to side. Um, these here, uh, going to salesman mode here a bit. Um, feels kind of weird saying this, but you know, these are the Wong raising hammers um, made by Sane Charles Stein. Um, if you're not familiar with his work, you should really check it out. Like, I think he makes some of the best hammers out there today, probably the best hammers. Um, beautiful, hand forged, individual works of art. And, well, let me. So, what I did working with him, I was using you know, my old petting hoss which is actually even nicer than the newer petting hosses, in my opinion. Um, these were the two I used the most, cross peen, and then this narrower faced one. But I find I would use this face, and I would use this face. So, basically combine them together into one. So this is what I use the most. But when I start doing um, multi-node vessels, which if you're not familiar with what I'm talking about, this is what I'm talking about, a vessel that's got working off more than one node. I need something narrower to get down into those spaces as it's raising, and that's just too much. So that's kind of what the narrow side is for, uh, or one of the things it can be for, anyway. Um, they do come in three different sizes. Without a doubt, I use the middle size the most. I find the weight is good for most operations. I personally would go to the heavyweight one if I'm doing larger scale pieces or sometimes on the outer course on some of them. Just when I want a little more force behind it, I'll go to this. There is also a lighter weight size. I use this more when I get into hammer chasing, which is a whole nother thing. Um, I find some people like this one as well too if you're doing smaller pieces or thinner gauge metals. It works good. If you're just gonna get one, I would go with the middle size. Um, i highlight one thing about the, the hammer handle. Um, and I have a blog post on my website as well that talks a lot about this and all the details and why I think these are the superior raising hammer out there today. Um, but this being a little bit wider, it's still kind of narrow. What I found is it just tucks into the palm because that extra width, I have a lot more control over this hammer than this one. And it doesn't seem like it would be much, but when you actually feel the difference, it's, it's amazing. Um, and hammering is a lot about control. So, okay, I'll quit blabbing about those hammers. Um, but that is what I'm gonna be using the most. Then um, we'll also use the good old rawhide when I get up to the edge of the vessel and I wanna be hammering right off the edge and onto my stake. Go with the rawhide, the non-marring mallet. You can use the, the plastic mallets as well, or wood mallets. Uh, and for the planishing stage, I go with this one. It's another old petting hoss. Um, I'll have to look up and see just what the weight is on this. But I like it because it's got the, the short head, which I feel I have a lot more control. The one side's slightly domed and the other side's flat. I tend to use the slightly domed side. Unless I'm doing a really big vessel, this is the hammer I use for planishing. Really big vessels, I get out actually an auto body hammer and work with it. But this is what I use for planishing. So um, that's basically the layout of the hammers we're gonna be using here. The disc is annealed and softened, um, cleaned up, pickled. And the first thing I do is use that center kernel I talked about to work around and scribe a, a few guidelines which will help me stay symmetrical as I start doing my raising. So just set my dividers and I don't have any straight measurements that I use. It's just kind of an eyeball it for a uh, half inch, three quarters of an inch. And 
describe the lines around. Some people prefer to use a Sharpie on the end so it doesn't make actual marks in the metal. I'm not worried about that so much. They're just going to get hammered out. But I'm also not just trying to gouge a line in. It's just enough for me to see. So I usually start out with a very quick course of sinking um, in order to help prevent what I call blowback. If you don't know what that is, I'll probably be able to show it to you here shortly. I bow. Because the, uh, the very sharp point that I'm going to do tends to make it anyway. So, but this reduces the blowback. So the critical point here where often beginning students get messed up is this is the outside of my vessel. I want to hammer, sink it down on the inside. So I'm hammering inside. Um, and I'm working into a depression in a wood block. So I usually start on the outer and work my way towards the inside. And when I say rough course, that's what I mean. I really don't do any more than that. Um, my rule of thumb is if you need to anneal afterwards, you did more than you needed to. But if you do need to anneal, then stop and anneal. I don't need to stop and anneal. So we can go from here right into the raising. So um, starting up with the raising, I've got my disc. It's already sunk. Um, and like I said before, I'm going to do this as a pointed vessel what I call a pointed vessel. So for that, I'm going to start with the stake it comes to the biggest point, sharpest point. And I'm not going to use this much, just a little bit. And I like, as I noted, I tend to use this sort of up at an angle. And to fit it into the vise, I find I have to mount it in the back so that this can slide down. As if I... Go so far before it hits. So I, I don't know if that made sense. <laughs> uh, okay. Tighten it down. Normally I'm wearing gearing protection while I'm working. I'm gonna put it on. I may end up taking it off because I usually when I'm teaching I find I don't just because I hate talking with these on it. I don't know. It bugs me. But we'll give it a go. If you're gonna do a lot of raising, you do want to wear gearing protection regularly. I also tend to wear a glove on my raising, or not my raising hand, my holding hand. Because I find this is the hand that does the most work. Um, this other hand really just swings the hammer. Um, and as you can see by the state of my glove, it really gets worn out. We'll often put the other glove on my other knee. It's not going to happen here yet, but later on, I find I'm often resting the vessel on my knee, and so this helps prevent me from tearing up my jeans. Okay, um, I've got the the medium size Wong raising hammer, and now the tricky part: trying to get this lined up right on the point. And my usually I start lightly hammering and really a watch to see where does it start to pop out. And I'm not gonna work on this stake much at all. I just needed to get that sharp point in the middle. Okay, so on this course, that is about all I'm going to do on this stake. I'm going to switch to the next stake. Uh, but yeah, let me pull this over here. But why am I starting on this? Um, it's because to get that point, I just can't get it on a stake that big. It's got to be on a little one. So I'm going to, that's why I start on it. And subsequent courses, I'll go back to that a little bit to get it really tightened up. But then I always try to move to the biggest stake I can to have the most control, most support. 
So, let's swap this out. Um, so, so, I tend to work the next ones up at not quite as steep of an angle. It's more comfortable working. And on this stake, again, I'm not going to work it too much, but I'm just trying to transition from that little point out a little bit farther. And then I'll switch to the next one. And I'm going to talk more later on as to what I'm really doing as far as trying to set an angle and get an air gap and, and all this stuff. But right now it's actually really hard to see. So I'm just, I'm, I'll wait till I get to larger stakes and talk about that more. <laughs> So I'm bracing it right in there. I'm going to hit just above that. So now we've got that going. It's about all I'm going to do on this stake. Swap it out to the next one. So I don't use these stakes much in terms of time, but I find them essential to actually getting this sort of form. So now the next one, I'm basically transitioning from that to a little bit larger. Same thing. Right now, I'm getting what I was talking about before when I said blowback. It could be even more dramatic if I hadn't started with a little sinking on this. But if you can see this in the cross section, you see how it's kind of, it's like it sinks down and comes up, sinks down, and, and then this is like it's coming back up around. If I didn't start with the sinking to get the whole thing moving a bit in this way, what happens is, is this outer edge really wants to flop back up. And then you're fighting that the whole time, this first course. Um, so this helps prevent a little bit of that. I'm going to take it over to my sinking stump, plop it down, and just do a few whacks right around there just to drop that back down. And then we'll progress on to the next size stick. I'm just going to pop this right over here. So a little sinking, sunken area underneath it and just... And that just kind of popped that out. So now we've got more of a profile without that dimple going in. Uh, okay, so next I'm going to move up to... This is the stake that I use probably the second most, not the most. But and for that reason it gets its own vice. I jokingly like to say is a metalsmith's doing raising. It's good to have lots of vices. Because then you don't have to keep swapping things out. You just switch from one vice to the next. So I tend to use this one about this angle. And again, I'm basically repeating what I did there. Um, I will talk more about the air gaps probably when I'm on the next day. But I'm just trying to transition from that point where I finished on the last stake up a little bit farther. Mm, you know, we'll see how far it goes here. So I 
feel myself braced right in that area. I'm going to hit above that. I should say too, <clears throat> when doing these pointed ones, you'll notice like this is the area I've worked, but you can see there's a lot of excess hammer blows have happened over there. So that area is getting work hardened. So I have to hammer a little bit harder. As I do this, I try and keep an eye on the angles overall, that it, it's staying smooth in the, the area I've finished, that everything's flowing nicely, the curves are good. Sometimes it helps to try and look at the profile um, to see how everything's lining up and not to let anything get too far out of whack. Um, but this is basically how far I would take it on this stake, because um, it fits in there. At this point, I can move to my largest stake, and that will give me the most support, making it easier to hold as I move on to everything else. Um, so let's move to the next one. So this is the vise I spend the most time at. Um, with my big steak. I found I like this one at a little bit of an angle. You could also get it more down flat, you know, whatever feels better for you, but I know, I've been liking it there. So this is called angle raising because the angle you hold the piece at changes this air gap back here. And that also changes the shape that you can get out of the piece. Um, so what I haven't talked about yet, because it's really hard to see early on, is that I'm going to be bracing this right in this area here, right on the stake. And that is where I am not going to hit. Because if I hit right there, then I'm squeezing it between two pieces of steel. And that would be thinning it out. That's what I don't want to do. I mean, it happens to some degree, but not. that's not what I want to do a lot of. I want to hit above that, where there's an air gap behind there because of the angle so that I can actually bend the metal down to the stake. And you'll probably hear this as I'm doing it, that there's a different sound. Initially it'll have more of a dull ring to it, or maybe not even ring, a dull sound, as I'm hitting over that air gap, and when it gets to the stake, there'll be a sharper ring. And that's how I can kind of know as I'm doing this where I'm at. And you'll hear sharper rings as I do this, as well as the dull. Usually I hammer first, I harder because I know I'm at the, the point with the air gap and it'll get down to the stake and then I do softer blows to kind of true everything up before I move on. So, okay. Um, so, up to the next room.
So that's roughly that ring around. I'm going to change my point of contact, move up to the next ring, and take it farther. There are lots of different schools of raising. A lot of people will see what I'm doing and think, I'm doing it all wrong. I'm breaking every single rule. Um, and I may be, but I'm demonstrating for you my approach to raising. I find there's lots of different ways to do it, and if they work for you, great. This to me seems like an efficient way that works well. Okay, so moving up my point of contact to there. I don't keep it all the way that way. I keep sliding it forward. As it gets going, especially as I get bigger pieces, like bigger discs, I find it's helpful if I'm sitting that I can get my knee up here to sort of sit underneath one side. It helps me to hold the angle that I keep it at. The part that I make it look really easy is this the holding hand. I'm holding it and I'm making lots of little adjustments. And I, we don't have time in this demo to talk about all this stuff. I, in my actual workshops, my initial demo is about four hours long. So this is an abbreviated version. Again, I'm not sure this is conveying well in here, but my initial hammer blows as I'm going into all the fresh, soft, annealed area, those tend to have the most force behind it to get the most movement. And then a lot of these other little marks are where I'm watching the subtle lumps and little changes in the curve, and I'm, I'm kind of trying to iron them out and make it a little bit smoother as it goes. Okay, so now we're getting up to the edge. Um, some people don't like to hammer right to the edge because you run the risk of slipping off and making a hammer mark like that, which may not show up in there. Um, I like the hammer marks. I tend to hammer to the edge more gently. Um, the other thing you can do is you can get the, the rawhide mallets and hammer right on the edge. I do a bit of both. Usually on my first course around, I do the hammering right up to the edge because I want the hammer mark texture over it all. One thing I will stop and note here too, I don't know if you can tell, but I've got a fairly loose grip on this hammer. I don't have this death grip trying to squeeze the life out of it. If you have that, you really don't have control 
and you're letting all the shock and vibrations go up your arm. It's going to wear you out pretty quick. I've got, to me, I consider it like the grip as though I'm doing sawing. It's just a light, I'm holding on to it. When I actually hit the metal, I'm almost not holding on to the hammer. Um, so I don't get all the vibrations coming up my arm, and I find I actually have more control that way. And again, we don't really have time to get into all of it. I'm more or less demonstrating what I do. But when I get into the workshops, I find with a lot of students, we do spend a lot of time talking about all the, the different ways people go wrong with hammering. But that's an important element for both control and for being able to do this long term and not injure yourself. You want it to be a fairly relaxed and easy sort of motion. Now there's still some little wiggles and ripples in here. It's not bad, but I usually do have the non-marring mallet, non-marring hammers right here to, to try and, I don't know if you can see that a little, right, just to smooth them out. Because with this, you can hammer right on the stake. It doesn't hurt anything. So this is really good for working right on the edge. One other little trick here. I've got this curve, this curve on the stake, and I've got this bigger curve on my vessel. In this earlier stages, sometimes it helps me to smooth this curve out. If instead of working here, I angle the whole thing, so I'm working across a longer curve on the stake. There's my little, little tip for you. And as the sides come up and it all comes in closer, then you'll be less of that and more over to the edge, or more over to front on. Um, okay, so this now represents the end of the first course. It's really work hardened at this point. It doesn't want to move anymore. I could force it a bit more, but I'm just wasting my time. So I'm going to stop and anneal it, and then we'll move on to course number two. I'm not going to show you the annealing process in between each one. It's it's the same thing. You heat it up so it's glowing that dull red, quench it, pickle it, and go on from there. Um, it is important, though, to anneal as you need to between each course. So even though I don't say this, that's what will be happening. Okay, I've gotten it out of the pickle. I've rescribed my lines, which I want to mention I do each time, each course as I need to. In this case, I'm going to work the whole thing, so I scribe the whole thing. Later on, I'll just do sections. However, we're running out of time, so we're going to have to speed this up and uh, start shooting this in time lapse. So here it goes.
Okay, um, so real quick here now, um, on to what I consider the last course of raising is the planishing course. Uh, and that's different from the others in that I'm no longer trying to hit on the air gap. I'm actually, when I have it on the stake, I want to hit at the point of contact so that I'm kind of squishing the middle down a little bit, not real hard, but I'm, I'm, essentially I just want to iron out the bumps and irregularities, smooth it all out. And for that, I just use my planishing hammer. I like the round, the slightly rounded side because I like the marks it makes better. And I use the same stakes I raised with. Usually they're at different angles, so I'm actually working on different parts of the stake than originally. But, you know, it's a, it's a slow and meticulous course. So we're gonna put this in a time lapse and go from there. First of all, everybody really loves your blue-eyed four-legged assistant. Yes, <laughs> Bo's great. <laughs> Sweet, especially when you speed up the film. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, so one of the questions that came through for those who may not have seen it in chat is, or joined late, what gauge do you, gauge of metal do you use? Um, I pretty much always use 18 gauge. I find for me that that's a good balance between I mean, with raisin, you want a certain thickness to it, so it'll actually compress well. If it gets too thin, it, it's hard to compress. But I also want it to move easily. So if you get it too thick, then you really got to hammer hard to, to get it to, to move. So I find 18 gauge is a good balance. Okay, great. Um, and then there were some questions about the, uh, the torch that you're using. And you did uh, put in chat that there's a link from uh, actually a blog site, theartisthomestead.com, and the complete link you'll find in the chat. Um, anything else you want to say about that? Um, not really. It's like, I love that torch, so it's good. Stella, I think you muted yourself accidentally. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm not hearing anything. Sorry. Um, and there then go. there were some questions about the stakes that you use, and um, there's some. You said there's some information on your website, which is davidwong.org. Is that correct for your website? Yep. yep, it's correct. Yeah, I've got a couple or a section there where I really go through the stakes, how I use them, and you know, I think how to get them to work with different vices. Um, and I think it can help people if they want to make their own. I will say too that um, I usually make them for workshops. Um, when I have extras left over, I put them up for sale. I do have some for sale right now. And for you all, I went in this morning and put them on sale. So they're $50 off the, the normal price through Sunday night or tomorrow night. Yay! Uh, yeah, there's, there's, a, uh, there's a time Yay! zone difference. Thank you. So don't go to the last minute. You may get cut out on the time zone difference. But, <laughs> but yeah, so there's a little, a uh, little, little money off if you're interested. So. Okay, great. Um, and then there's also on your uh, website information about the raising hammers as well. Yep. 
And um, someone asked about the vice that you use. I noticed there, there was a little bit, a label on the side that said La Pin, L-A-P-I-N. I don't know if they're still making the vices, but I thought that's what I saw on the side of it. Yeah, I've got a bunch of different vices. I think when the question first came up, I was on the the vice where I kept swapping the stakes out on. And I wish I remembered what, like normally that's always right here, but it's like just poof, went away. Um, <laughs> this is actually one of the nice, really old vices where you don't just mount it on any old table. You actually have to cut a notch out of the stump or the table for an extra wedge to fit in. So it sits really nice and secure, which you know I found at a flea market for like 25 bucks or something years ago. It's like, I wish I could get more of those. Mm -hmm. The other vices I have are actually just the cheap vices. Like this was before, I bought them before Harbor Freight was around, but it's like essentially what you'd find at Harbor Freight. Um, you know, the $50 vice and they work good. Um, I, I will say about vices, I try and get ones that have as few moving parts as possible. So like the, the really nice one, it just goes in and out. That's it. That's mm -hmm. what I want. Um, the other ones will have the swivel this way as well as going in and out. Um, and I don't know if you noticed, but one of them that I was working on that had the biggest stake in, that swivel this way actually broke. So I just pulled that whole bottom section off and then just mounted it down straight to the stump. So it just goes in and out. And the other one still has that other swivel. And, and, and that's generally what you'll find, which works. There is another type of vise which rotates this way and this way and goes in and out. Great for lots of things, not great for raising. So I would avoid those. Perfect, great. And then one other question came in because I know we were fast, fast forwarding the video. Someone uh, in the group asked, actually, how long does it take uh, from start to finish excluding patina? Uh, to raise a vessel like the one you showed us in the demo? Yep, that's a good question. When I get often, um, I will preface this with one, I am really fast at this. Um, I've gotten to be efficient. Part of my efficiency is I usually am not raising just one piece at a time. I'm usually doing about six. And so that actually makes it more efficient that I'll anneal them all at once and pull them out and you kind of get through those processes quicker. Um, so that makes it quicker for me. If I condense the time out and I'm really staying focused on it, doing a piece of the size I was doing in this six inch disc, it takes me about an hour to an hour and a half to get the basic raising done from flat to the basic form. And then another half hour, 45 minutes usually to planish out a piece of that size. So gives you an idea. The commitment. Yeah. Um, and then just, I think one last question uh hand fatigue is a problem i saw you were wearing a a glove in the hand that you're holding with any suggestions for for hand fatigue and arm fatigue yep um the, the big thing i tell all my students when i'm doing workshops um is make sure you're fully hydrated drink nice. lots of water it sounds kind of odd but when your body doesn't have all the water it needs it pulls it from other areas it considers are less critical, like what's flushing out the toxins in your muscles or the little joint, the cushions in your joints um, to feed things that things are important, like your brain, you know, probably a good idea overall. But when we're really stressing the body this way, it's, it's critical to stay fully hydrated. And I mean, I won't go into all my little stories here, but I've had some pretty dramatic results of like when I'm not fully hydrated, my arm is just so sore and I've got to quit and stop. And then I, you know, drink a big tall glass of water and 15 minutes later, I'm good to go the rest of the day. Um, so it, that is a major thing. Um, Great advice. And typically we're warm here, not today, but typically yeah. warm in, in Southern California. All right. I think that's um, all the questions. I'm just running through real quick. Looks that, yeah, I think we, we answered everything at uh, david any last um i see someone did ask how i put the rim on the top and yeah. is it kombu inside um so the the rim on top is a, a sterling silver round wire and i you know I, I will take the the rim of the vessel and i'll grind it down flat so it's a good smooth surface then i will essentially make one big giant jump ring 
which is the rim, set it on. And then I use wire solder, get it kind of rolling on a lazy Susan sort of a kneeling pan and just kind of feed it in and let it flow. You know, the, the torch solder flows to the hottest point. So with the torch, I can change what the hottest point is and just draw that bead around. And it's, it sounds like it would be hard, but it's really not that bad once you get a little coordinated. It's lots of fun. Um, as far as the interior of my work, or the, the gold on the inside does not come boo. Um, that would be kind of nice, but not, not going to work. Um, it's actually gold leaf. So I do with just, you know, I paint on a, an oil-based sizing, a, a glue, and let it get just barely tacky, and then just kind of carefully lay down all the we are getting some audio feedback. Some yeah. feedback. Um, Luckily, I think that that was the last question. It was. <laughs>